If you're not fluent in internet speak and you saw something like this on Twitter, it might seem pretty weird. And really, who does that person think they're fooling? As of the early 2020s, there's a trend on Twitter and other social media platforms where people will write a person's name in a way that any person could recognize it, if they had the right context. But computers wouldn't recognize it, at least most of the time. This is an example of how the internet and all the people on it are co-creating a new kind of language, making ways that we can speak directly to non-human audiences, withhold things from some audiences, and write in hybrid ways that both get what we want from human and non-human audiences. It's worth learning this skill since non-human audiences are all over these days. I'm Dr. Emily Zarka, a human, and welcome to Study Hall Rhetoric and Composition. When people omit letters from words like this on social media, they're often trying to write freely about something or someone, partially because using asterisks or some other non-letter symbol slows down the social media search engine. This post would be unlikely to pop up if I searched my own name on Twitter. A search engine is an example of what we are calling a non-human audience, which are any automated applications, computer programs, or algorithms that connect with our writing. So first, let's discuss a little bit how search engines and other computer programs work. Our world is made so much more convenient and helpful because of technology that relies on algorithms, which are step-by-step -step procedures for solving a problem. Think of how search engines have developed a set of behind-the-scenes steps that makes it possible to search for something like best pet finch varieties and generate results that are relevant to the question. Instead of reading like human audiences, search engines and other algorithm-based programs do something called crawling, which for our purposes involves looking across the internet for keywords, phrases, and code data that indicate that a particular document is relevant to a question or topic. And sites like Twitter don't have to use outside information, but they also use keywords in all the other data they gather about individual users to show them tweets from accounts they might like. They use hashtags to help showcase what a tweet is about. And if someone is searching for the hashtag FinchMom, and I happen to be using it a lot, Twitter's algorithms are able to dish up some of my hot, hot bird takes to those users. As a result, some of our writing is done for the final human audiences we're trying to reach. But other parts of our writing, like those hashtags, is done for the computers who are going to affect where and how our work gets displayed. After all, a human knows if a tweet is about birds or not, even without a hashtag. The fact that computer algorithms shape much of what we see on the internet may sound kind of scary, but it can also be really helpful when we want our work to be noticed by certain people or not noticed by others. A great example of how algorithms fit into our everyday internet writing is if we visited a website for, say, our favorite pet store, but we can't find a list of their open hours easily. There might be a little pop-up with a friendly little bird icon asking, is there anything I can help you with? And offering us a space to type a message. These chatbots aren't humans, even if they can connect us over to a human pretty easily if our question is too complex for them to type a message back as we're having a conversation. Instead, they have some programmed answers and their interactions with us are pre-written and interconnected through keywords. Like if the bot has been coded to offer the open hours of the bird shop when asked a question with the keyword hours in it, they might fully answer our written question with no humans involved in the moment. So writing for non-human audiences can feel informal and natural even. But sometimes the non-human audience can complicate a high stakes writing assignment, like applying for a new job. Many companies that hire a lot of people now use applicant tracking systems or ATS software. These platforms are programmed to screen hundreds of resumes or cover letters to help hiring managers review the most qualified applicants. Maybe a human reading our resume and cover letter could see exactly how relevant our experience is to their job description, but if we aren't including any of the keywords that the software algorithm is looking for, it might show up lower in the online stack of applications and not get reviewed thoroughly by the human team. This means that when we're crafting a resume for a job application, we have to consider both the hiring manager we're trying to reach 
and the computer program that decides how good a fit will be for the job based on its computer analysis. And there are times when learning more about non-human audiences actually allows us to better achieve our goals as writers, even as we also keep the humans in mind as we write. Like Tony works in marketing at the Birds on the Brain Pet Supply Company. His role is to write informative and interesting blog posts so that the rest of the team can share them on social media. They also want people who search for bird supplies to find this content. At first, he uses lessons he's learned from past feedback on his writing, things like varying his vocabulary and writing long, thoughtful sentences. His boss, Celeste, sits down for a coaching meeting with him after she reviews Tony's first post. Celeste points out that very vocabulary is good for the final reader, but he needs to take it a step further, including their top keywords in his posts three to five times each. It's a little bit less variety than he's used to, but in exchange, it signals to the search engines that this post is definitely about the best water bowl for birds, making the algorithm more likely to show his post to searchers for that term. She also points out that the search engines seem to prefer posts that have shorter, punchier sentences. Not every long long sentence is incorrect, but she shows Tony how to work on the length of his sentences using a different non-human audience, an online app called Hemingway Editor that identifies long sentences by highlighting them. Celeste is careful to point out the ways that Tony's work is succeeding for his human audiences so that he can keep those qualities moving forward. Then she shows him how to get that great content into the hands of passionate bird owners everywhere by catering to the needs of the non-human search engine audience too. As algorithms become more sophisticated, it's possible that there will be more and more crossover in how we communicate. But at least as we're making this episode in 2022, there are some things that algorithms typically do differently than human audiences that we can keep in mind when writing. First, algorithms tend to be worse at context than human readers for the most part. If you remember, context includes all the factors surrounding a communication that influence how effective the writing is. Like they can also still be fooled by sentences that use positive language to say something negative or vice versa. If I wistfully wrote, I hate that I can't eat that sandwich again, a computer's language processing might use words like hate and can't to assume a negative tone rather than high praise for my lunch. Algorithms can also take too much or too little information into account when making a decision. For instance, algorithm bias is when algorithms give results that reflect hidden biases in society or give inaccurate predictions based on limited data sets. We all have bias of some sort or other, and bias isn't inherently bad. But bias can lead to certain groups of people being treated unfairly and serious discrimination problems. So if the data used to train an algorithm that's used for hiring only includes a limited type of people, the algorithm might discriminate against candidates with different backgrounds, even if a human hiring manager would see they are qualified for the job. Our communication is complicated. And as of 2022, we're still trying to help algorithms navigate what context to pay attention to and what to ignore. But there are steps we can take to write for non-human audiences as best we can. Acknowledging that algorithms don't always catch subtle context means that they benefit from what we human writers call signposts or obvious references to what we want to be noticed. Think of signposts as the way that when someone is speaking, we may nod along when good points come up. We're giving them cues that they're on the right track. Mentioning birds in general in an article could be a fluke, just like this video isn't really about birds, even though we mention them a lot. Like Tony had to add the exact phrase the searchers are looking for, best water bowl for birds, a few different times to make it particularly obvious to the non-human audience that they found an article relevant to that topic. We also use signposts like keywords when applying for jobs. We want to scan job descriptions for the phrases that seem to be the most important to the role, and we want to include them word for word in our application materials. Six years of experience written out might trigger the system to credit our application for meeting that requirement, while in more than half a decade working on set design might not be enough of a signpost for the non-human audience to catch it. The trick is figuring out how to write for both human and non-human audiences. Writing deliberately for non-human audiences sometimes manifests as what would be bad grammar or rude in a human conversation, which is fine if we're just searching something or interacting with a chatbot, but not if we have a combination audience. Imagine if I just started a conversation with a stranger by saying, best water bowl for birds, out of the blue. 
My goal isn't obvious there, even if the non-human search engine knows just what to offer based on that phrase. So in each writing scenario we encounter, we should think about whether we're focused on human, non-human, or both kinds of audiences, and how we can prioritize each audience's needs as we draft and revise our work. It's a weird thought experiment to imagine computers as gatekeepers, deciding what we see when we go looking for information and who sees our writing when we share it with the world. Already, social media users have started noticing that the algorithm shows certain posts more than others to their friends, like posts that include a picture versus text-only posts. Many question why certain social sites prioritize the kind of posts they do, but others just add a random photo. Wanting the algorithm to fit our needs better doesn't stop us from working around it when necessary. And it's not completely clear how computer algorithms will affect us in 5, 10, or 20 years, but it's unlikely that their influence will lessen. That's a big reason why our efforts to write with our audience in mind should include some research into the relevant non-human audiences. For a lot of our everyday writing, we're likely writing to a hybrid audience. So we can't offer the key details that will help our human audience respond in the ways we desire, but we also offer the signposts that the non-human audience needs when an algorithm's behaviors will impact our effectiveness. Diving in and figuring out when non-human audience concerns are influencing our work is just another great way to become adaptive, thoughtful writers in our rapidly internetifying world. Thanks for watching Study Hall Rhetoric and Composition, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU in the links in the description. See you next time.